Lord Jesus in the song that we're singing, one of the lines is, I never want to leave. And as we sang that song, the Holy Spirit said simply, you don't have to. You don't have to leave. You don't have to leave. You can learn to walk in the intimacy in the comfortableness, in the awareness that God is there. God isn't only there when he speaks. I've been married long enough to know that after years of investing in life together that I don't know what else to call it other than a contented quiet. There's a contented quiet at just being together being in the same room, living in the same house. You're not talking all the time. It's not all deep, intimate conversations. There's just a beauty and a peace when you learn to live in the presence of somebody else. And that's, that's what we have with the Lord. This kind of place, this kind of environment needs to be a place that we get used to and we are, become very comfortable in waiting and lingering on God. What, what do we think was happening in the upper room before the Spirit of God was poured out? They were waiting, enjoying, waiting. And so, Father, we thank you for your presence and we thank you for the words that you inspired in the hearts of sons and daughters in these songs that give expression to our souls and our spirits for what it means to be the people of God who know how to walk with you and be with you. And Lord, now we get to stay in your presence. We get to stay in your presence. So through your word, Lord, continue to keep us in your presence. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Oh, it's wonderful to have you here. It's just so good to be together with God's people in God's house, to be the body of Christ, to be the church, not to come to church, but to be the church together. Doesn't it feel good? Oh, it feels good. Look at somebody around you. Just, just look at them. You've missed them. They've missed you. It's good. It's good. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, from that beautiful sentiment, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's an oh oh. And I just want you to know, just want to say at the outset, that God started this conversation with me, and now you're going to get drug into it. Because, anyway, I'll just leave it at that. Im imagine, imagine if you can, this was the image. Imagine a mouthful of dirt or gravel or sand. Just open up your mouth, dump it in, and... Have you ever been at the beach or roasted something or whatever, and you bite into it and it's got sand in it? Okay, now, you, now you're with me. That's our topic for today. Turn to Numbers chapter 11 with me in your Bibles. And I want you to do something really important. I want you to notice the progression of, of, that happens in these scriptures. Numbers 11.1. 1. Now the people became like those who complain of adversity in the hearing of the Lord. And when the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled. And the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the outskirts of the camp. And the people therefore cried out to Moses, and Moses prayed. Everyone say, Moses prayed. Moses prayed. And the Lord, uh, to the Lord, and the fire died out. Oh, all right. Corporately, whew, right? Ah, lesson learned, right? Yeah, wrong. Nope, watch, watch now. Watch Numbers 14. Numbers 14, verse 2. All the sons of Israel... All the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, 
Would that we had died in the land of Egypt or in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become plunder. Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another. Everyone say, they said it to one another. Notice the progression. It wasn't just that there was complaint about adversity. Now they're starting to talk about the adversity that they're in. And it says, let us appoint a leader and return to Egypt. Well, interesting how it doesn't stop with complaining. Uh, it didn't stop the complaining, that whole fire at the edge of the camp. Uh, it moves on to complaining with, about, with others. Follow the projection, the, the progression of this. Now we find ourselves in number 16, verse 1. And I'm going to read a truncated version of this passage just to get through it. I'd invite you to read the whole chapter. Now Korah and his buddies, they took action and they rose up with 250 leaders of the congregation chosen in the assembly, men of renown. Verse 3, and against Moses and Aaron and said to them, you have gone far enough for all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is in their midst. So why do you exalt yourselves? Above the assembly of the Lord. Now we're not just complaining. Now we're not just complaining together, but now we're beginning to attack. Now we're going on the offensive. We feel justified. And Moses, everyone say, fell on his face. <laughs> he prayed again, falls on his face. And in verse 16, Moses says to Korah, Before the Lord tomorrow, both you and Aaron, Take his fire pan and put incense on it, and each of you bring his censer before the Lord. Verse 19, thus Korah assembled all the congregation against them. See the progression? All the congregation was against them at the doorway of the tent of meeting. And the glory of the Lord appeared to everyone. Everybody go, ooh. Okay, this is serious. The, the Lord's presence has shown up. Remember last time it showed up? It was fire started to burning into the camp. Verse 20, then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, separate yourselves from among this congregation that I may consume them instantly. Verse 22, but Moses and Aaron fell on their faces. Everyone say they fell on their faces. <laughs> again, again. And they prayed, when one man sins, Lord, will you be angry with the entire congregation? Lord, they're not all bad. Surely they're not all bad. So, Lord, would you spare them? See, God was saying, Moses, Aaron, you two, get out of there. They're all, I'm done with all of them. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, verse 23, verse 24, speak to the congregation, saying, depart now from the tents of these wicked men and touch nothing that belongs to them, or you will be swept away in all of their sin. Notice the progression. Notice the warning of the Lord. Be careful you will get swept away with this thing. And so they got back, and Moses said, by this you shall know that the Lord has sent me, for this is not my doing. If the ground swallows them up and they descend alive into Sheol, just pause for a moment. Did you hear what he just said? These people are going to fall directly into hell, alive. That's scary. Then you will understand that these men have spurned who? The Lord. They have spurned the Lord. And as he finished speaking all these words, the ground that was under them split open, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up. And their households and all the men who belonged to Korah with, his, with their possessions, fire also came forth from the Lord and consumed the 250 men who were offering the incense. Oh, man. Now that's an exciting day at the office if you're Pastor Moses. Surely, Surely now, God's message has become abundantly clear, right? Nope. Numbers 16, 41. But the, on the very next day, everyone say, the next day, <laughs> the next day, all the congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron, saying, you are the ones who have caused the death of the Lord's people. Now, what did Moses just say to them the day before? 
Do they really think that Moses opened the earth and swallowed the rebels? Who can do that? There's no man that can do that. But they're going to blame Moses anyway. You have caused. And it came about, however, when the congregation had assembled against Moses and Aaron, they turned towards the tent of meeting, and behold, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord appeared. Everyone say, uh-oh. Uh-oh. By now, it's not just ooh. By now, it's uh uh-oh. Here we go again. The last two times the glory of the Lord appeared, it did not go well for us. And then Moses and Aaron came to the front of the tent of meeting. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Get away from among this congregation, that I may consume them instantly. By the way, that was where God started the first time. God accepted the intercession of Moses and Aaron, but now we're back to the same place that God was before that. Did God know how deep the cancer had gone? Yes, he did. And then what did they do? I'll give you a guess. They fell on their faces. Everyone say it. They fell on their faces. Moses said to Aaron, take your censer and put it Uh, in it a fire from the altar and lay some incense on it then bring it quickly to the congregation and make atonement for them for the wrath has gone forth from the Lord and the plague has begun verse 47 then Aaron took it as Moses had spoken and he ran into the midst of the assembly everyone say he ran he ran to the midst of the assembly and for behold the plague had begun among the people verse 41 and he took his stand between the dead and the living How would you like to be Aaron running in with your little censer and your little bit of incense, seeing a plague sweeping through and killing people? Would you throw yourself in the wake, in the face of that tidal wave of destruction for a bunch of rebellious, mumbling, complaining, murmuring people? And yet that's what he does. So the plague was checked. God would not destroy Aaron. He would stop right there. But those who died by the plague were 14,700 people. 14,700 people plus those who had been swallowed by the earth. Over 15,000 people of the children of Israel are now dead. I'm not sure if it's our pride. I'm not sure if it's our arrogance, if it's our ambition or our God complex. You know that God complex thing? that we always know better than everyone else, including God, what is good and bad, right and wrong. But there is one thing that seems universally evident through the ages and generations of mankind, and that is that we murmur and complain a lot. A lot. It has never been so apparent to me as in the last 13 months. Mankind is truly infected The words of the serpent ring to life and continue to resonate through man's history. Genesis 3, 5, the enemy whispers to Adam and Eve, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Isn't that really the root of murmuring and complaining? That everyone else is stupid and you know better. Surely, I would do better. I would never do that. I would never do that. Why are they doing that? They keep doing that. What a bunch of fill in the blank. How many of you have done that this past week? Go ahead. Oh, come on. Don't add lying to your murmuring and complaining. Seriously, come on. How many of you have murmured or complained this week? I've got my hand up. Come on. Confession is good for the soul. Let judgment start in the house of God. Oh, wait, I see a fire on the edge of the church. (laughs) Oh, boy. Oh, boy. It's a predictable human pattern. In John 6, many of his disciples, when they heard that he said, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood, they said, this is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, conscious that his disciples grumbled at this, said to them, does this cause you to stumble? Another translation says, does this cause you to take offense? Are you offended by the actions, by the choices, by the words of others? As Numbers shows us, this thing, this complaining and 
and grumbling and murmuring has the power to become chronic and it picks up momentum and it's like a cancer that just takes over the human soul. Let's call it what it is, first of all. Listen, we all face trouble. I get it. I get stress. I complain too. I know, it's disappointing for you. Uh, when I'm driving, is probably the worst. I complain about other drivers a lot. But let me say this. Stress does not justify, frustration does not justify the things that we say in our judgment. Does it? We are responsible for how we respond. But what is it? There was this one guy who faced a lot of diversity, and his name was Job. And what do we read about him? Job 122. Through all of this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. <laughs> Even when his wife told him, forget it. Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die, she said. But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Which is, by the way, a little catchphrase around our house. <laughs> and by the way, any man can speak as the foolish woman here spoke too. Can I have an amen from the men? Amen. We, can be, we can be every bit as foolish, and we know we are. Shall we indeed accept from God good and not accept adversity? And all of this, Job did not sin with his lips. What would constitute sinning with your lips? Accusing God unjustly. Cursing God for your problem. As the spies returned to report after scouting out the promised land, Exodus 16, 8, for the Lord hears your grumblings, which you grumble against him. I'd like to propose to you that all of our grumbling is really grumbling against the way God is managing our lives. The things he's allowing, the people he's allowing in power. We don't like it, and so we grumble and complain. And Moses says, and who are we? Your grumblings against, uh, are, are not against us, but against the Lord. The same thing happened to Samuel when they rejected Samuel as being the leader over Israel. God told him, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. They're rejecting my choice of you. They're rejecting my system to be a theocracy, to be led by God. 1 Corinthians 10, 9 to 11. Nor let us try the Lord as some of them did and were destroyed by the serpents, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them Everyone say, as an example. That's what the scripture says. Those, that story we read is recorded as an example that they were written for our instruction. So that is recorded in scripture so that you and I today can learn the lessons that they had to learn the hard way upon whom the ends of the age have come. This is written for us in our modern day. Philippians 2.14, do all things without grumbling or disputing. James 5, do not complain, brethren, against one another, so that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. You know, murmuring and complaining are dangerous not just because of themselves, but because they always have conjoined twins. They have com companions come with them. Critical spirit, a critical spirit. Complaining mindset warps the way you think and see things. Have you ever gotten a bad first impression of a person and it was very difficult to shake? And later on, and maybe it took many, many interactions with them until you finally realized, I think I was wrong. I think maybe I was wrong. But how hard is it to overcome a bad impression of somebody? Because it warps the way you see them and you always see them in the light you begin to see them in. And when we begin to view the world through the critical lens of our own godhood that we know better and we know everything, it warps the way we see everybody. Have you ever had a fight with somebody you love? To the point of where you're so mad, it wouldn't matter what they did or said, you are going to still be mad. And there is no pleasing them. 
There's no pleasing you when you're mad at them. There's no pleasing them when they're mad at you. You can apologize, but you know they're still angry. Who has experienced that? What happens? It's, it's the example of how our mind and our thinking is distorted by this spirit. And it eventually produces a spirit of rebellion, as we saw in the book of Numbers with Korah and all the people of Israel. I guarantee you that that rebellion did not start that day. In fact, I can show you a scripture. Psalm 106, verse 24. It says, Then they despised the pleasant land. <laughs> they despised the promise that, of the thing that God had promised them. And they did not believe in his word. So there's a, a, a healthy dose of unbelief and faithlessness. And it says, And they grumbled in their tents. You know, before there's a rebellion, there's a lot of grumbling in the tent. There's a lot of grumbling in the bedroom. There's a lot of grumbling at Tim Hortons. There's a lot of roast pastor this and roast politician that and roast leader this. And how, how many of you know that this is true? Pender, is that true? Pender's laughing. You should come up and tell stories. Right now, you could illustrate the rest of this message, my brother, with no trouble at all. They grumbled in their tents, and they did not listen to the voice of the Lord. Therefore, he swore to them that he would cast them down in the wilderness, and that he would cast their seed among the nations and scatter them in the land. There is a generational impact. It's not just about your complaints. It's what your complaints do to your family, to your kids. It's, it's the consequence of the choice we make to walk in that spirit. And it affects our families and our children and generations that come. John 6, 41. Therefore the Jews were grumbling about him because he had said, I am the bread that came down of heaven. And Jesus answered and said to them, do not grumble among yourselves. What's interesting about this is who we tend to grumble with. Now, okay, who, who here though realizes life can be stressful and that people do wrong things? All right. Fair enough. Is God saying, am I saying to you that you should just zip it? <laughs> just shut your mouth and just go with the flow. What are we missing here? Well, how about talking to the person you have a problem with instead of to everyone else? That might be a start. And I've got another solution for you that we're going to get to in a moment. How about asking some questions instead of leaping to judgment? How about presuming that you don't know everything and that maybe you're missing some information that might have a bearing on why the decisions are being made that are being made and that you are not privy to all of the, in, all the data? Because sometimes a little bit of a dose of reality and a dose of truth changes your perspective on everything. Well, if I had known that, I wouldn't have been critical. Yeah, you should have presumed that that was there, and not started with being critical. How about that? Assume that there are valid reasons for people doing things. At least give them the benefit of the doubt. At least a start. That would be a, a, a step in the right direction. Were the accusations of spiritual elitism against Moses and Aaron actually true? When we read the passage, who do you think you are? The Spirit of God resides in all the people. You're arrogant and cocky and you're leading us astray and, and, and you're the one who killed the people. Were any of these accusations even true? Which proves how distorted their vision was. No. In fact, what we see is we see Aaron jumping into the wave of death that is sweeping through the camp not knowing whether he will survive it or not. We see Moses and Aaron falling on their faces. 2 Timothy chapter 2. The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach. Everyone repeat this part with me. Patient when wronged. With gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth, that they may come to their senses. Now everybody listen very carefully that they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil 
having been held captive by him to do his will. How's that for a scary verse? Have you ever been held captive by the enemy to do his will and found out you're on the wrong side of it? There's a vast difference between thoughtful inquiry and a critical spirit. None of us is above accountability that is needed for spiritual health, for relational health. But have you ever met someone who has a critical spirit? Is there a name or a face that comes to mind? Can I ask you, how much fun was it to be around them or to work with them? Don't we just start avoiding them altogether? So are you one of them? Just ask it. I'm not accusing anyone. I just know when I get into a critical spirit, I know I'm difficult to be around because everyone leaves. My boys leave. My wife is suddenly out in the garden or whatever. And when I go out to spend time with her, she leaves again. <laughs> She's being nice. She's trying not to say what I need to realize. I remember hearing someone one time, and he was quite angry. And I, I just said to Sharon, and I had this moment, and I looked over at Sharon, and I said, is that what I sound like? And she said, yes. And I was just like, that's not good. But the Lord actually said, that's what you sound like. <laughs> that was what started that question. Is that what you sound like? Okay, so let's recognize this. Which side are we on? <laughs> this is an opening for Satan. Genesis 4, 6 and 7. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. And its desire is for you. But you must master it. You must master it. Cain didn't master it. He didn't sort it out with God, and so he took it out on Abel. And when we don't sort it out with the person that our trouble is with, we tend to take it out on everybody else. And everybody now is going to pay the price. And so Abel dies because Cain takes offense at God. James 3, 6 reminds us that the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. Proverbs 18, 21. Death and life in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit. Okay, we live in a consistent reality. So here's just a reality checkup for all of us. Tell me and just say amen. If you say amen with my statement, I'll move on and not bang away at you until you agree, okay? I'll say, nothing has changed from the beginning. Here we go. God has dignified humanity with free will. Amen? With that privilege comes responsibility. Free will people are broken by sin. And it manifests in many ways. People also are diverse in their race, their history, and their experience. Their personality, their values, their priorities, and opinions. Which guarantees, point five, there will be no shortages of collisions, offenses, agendas, options, behaviors, and values. There will be collisions. In which... I will be as much of an enigma to others as they are to me. Let's try that again. You will be as irritating to everyone else as they are to you. Which uh, makes me pose this question. Are you still surprised by this? Are you still surprised? That this is the nature of living? <laughs> that that's the way people are going to be? And that this is coming your way every day? Does this still throw you off center? Does this still control you and provoke you to react rather than taking responsibility for responding? We are now confronted by our responsibility for our own decision. 
in essence, how are you going to handle what is inevitable? That there is going to be more than enough fodder to complain about. What is your choice in response? Which side are you on? Well, I think we can look at a list from Galatians 5 that we touched on, and I'm not going to read it for you because you know this passage. We already went through it. There is a set of fleshly responses and a a set of spiritual responses. And one of them is of God and the other is not. What are the roots of our response? I think it depends, but there's a whole lot of things in play. So be aware of what's going on inside of you. Ask yourself, why is it that this is so upsetting to me? Is it, am I thinking with my emotions? Did it provoke me emotionally and therefore it's tainting my thinking? Or did I see something that bothers my thinking and now I'm getting emotional about it? You see, those two things always go together. Are you thinking about it just in your perspective or are you thinking about it from a we perspective? Is this just about you? Is the world just about you? Or maybe there's a place where there's some common ground. And we should think about that. Maybe it's an issue of right and wrong. Jesus saw things that were wrong and he dealt with them. There are things that are right and wrong and and we can speak up. But how we speak up is a very important thing, which of course is our mouthful of gravel, right? How about the impact? Have we thought about what the impact, what are we sowing and reaping in our response to these situations in life? Have we thought about, and to be fair, you have to survive it. And so, Do you need to limit your screen time? Do you need to cut off social media? Do you not need to watch all the bad news all the time every day? Because it affects the way you see the world. Do you need to limit certain people in your life? Because they lead you. Like an alcoholic in a bar. They lead you to just have one drink. And we get caught up and off we go. Motivation. What is our motive? What is it we want to do? What is it we want to accomplish? Who is it that we really want to be? 1 Corinthians 13 comes to my mind. Without love, everything else is just noise. So is there love in my response? So what's the alternative then? What's the alternative to this murmuring, complaining, and just calling out all the stuff we're going to see in the world all around us every day? Well, praise God, there sure is an alternative. God's instruction to be salt and light in a sinful world. The world will know us by our love for others, which will be reflected in our language about others. Yes? Let me try again. The world will know us by our love for others, and it will be reflected in our language when we talk about others. Yeah. We are living stones. We are living stones in the house of God. Okay, here's a quick Bible study for you. I'm going to go through this fast. I'll provide you with all these verses if you want them. Just text the office or call the office. 1 Timothy 2.8. Just listen. Just listen. 1 Timothy 2.8. Therefore, I want men in every place to pray. Everyone say pray. Like Moses. Say like Moses. Right. Fall on your face. Pray. Lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. 1 Thessalonians 5.8, Thessalonians 5, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God for you. Philippians 2.14 and 15, do all things without grumbling or disputing, so that you will prove yourself to be blameless and innocent, children of God, above reproach, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights in the world. Praise God <laughs> that there's a light in the world. Ephesians 4.29, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment so that you will give grace to those who hear. If you murmur and complain, what generally happens? Do people join you? Yeah. So what kind of an influence are we going to be? 1 Peter 5, therefore humble yourselves, casting your anxiety on him. Share your anxiety with God. That means be careful who you talk to about this. But I would say start by talking to God. Don't talk to others. Talk to God about your stresses and your frustrations. 2 Corinthians 10, we are destroying speculations, every lofty thing that raised up against the knowledge of Christ, and we are taking every thought captive to obedience to Christ. 
Romans 12, 3. I say to everyone among you not to think of yourselves more highly than he ought to think, but to have, I added the word, realistic perspective. Realistic perspective. You don't know everything. The word actually says sound judgment. Okay, is that enough? Do you get it? You, you get what the word of God is saying? I don't think you get it. Let me keep going. <laughs> Philippians 2.4. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also the interests of others. Romans 6.13. Do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness but present yourself to, those, to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness. And that starts with the tongue. 1 Thessalonians 5.12, we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you, whether that's the waitress who serves you, the person in the store who takes your order or checks you out, or the other drivers. This is a hard one. Oh, Lord. The drivers on the streets of Grand Prairie or everybody else. The politicians that serve us, the police officers that pull you over and give you a ticket because you were speeding. It doesn't matter whether you saw the sign, you were speeding, so just take the ticket. Sorry, officer. Every, you know what? If you're nice to them, every once in a while they let you off with a warning. Especially if you're a woman, which I'm not going to complain about right now, but I just, that's, I'm not complaining, I'm just stating the facts. <laughs> which, by the way, is, is a very sneaky way of complaining. <laughs> so here I am, guilty of sinning right while I'm preaching. Oh, God, it goes deep, man. It goes way deep. Matthew 12, but I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for it in the day of judgment. Everyone go, oh, poo. <laughs> that one hurts. That one hurts. Doesn't it? For by your words you will be justified, and by your words will you will be condemned. Ephesians 4, be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down in your anger. Do not give the devil an opportunity. Matthew 7, by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye and not notice the log that's in your own? Philippians 4, be anxious for nothing, but with prayer, bring it to God. Whatever is good, right, honorable, just think on these things and the God of peace will be with you. Listen, I, I just put together, I, it occurred to me that I can't, have a spirit of prayer. I can't be, have a spirit of faith and prayer at the same time as I have a critical spirit. I, it, they just don't coexist. They're like fear and faith. If you're of faith, you have no fear. <laughs> Perfect faith casts out fear. Love casts out fear. And so they just, they just don't coexist at all. So look at this little short list I put together in three minutes. Look at the comparison. Complaint versus prayer. Complaint focuses on the problem of a broken world. Prayer focuses on God's solutions for a broken world. Complaint challenges God's character and his power. Prayer honors and invites God's will. Complaint, thoughts and emotions running rampant. Prayer brings thoughts captive to the word of God and to truth. Complaint captivates uh, and cultivates further negative emotions. Prayer brings peace to the soul and to the mind. Complaint does not promote solutions. Prayer invites wisdom, truth, and God's will. Complaints expect solutions from impotent sources. If people would just get it right, this world would be a better place. Nope, that's not a biblical perspective. Who's going to make this world right? Right? Anticipates God as the source of help. Complaints lead to like-minded associations. You wind up in the company of complainers. Because, you know, one birds of a feather sort of a thing. Uh, but prayer leads to spiritual partnerships, especially intimacy with God. We can jump down the list. Attention to fallible humans comes from complaints. Your attention is on the wrong thing, whereas prayer directs attention to the sovereign power of God. Slide two. <laughs> you thought there was just one slide? <laughs> oh, you, you crazy people. <laughs> oh, you're so cute. Ah. Now, sinful, carnal, fleshly versus righteous, spirit-led and pleasing to God. Complaint is a baited trap of Satan. Prayer is a powerful tool from God. Complaint brings a curse. Prayer brings a blessing. Complaint negatively influences others, and it angers God. Prayer brings the accountability to self and to others and pleases God. And this is just off the top of my head. 
Listen, people of God, we need to sow life rather than breeding discontent. Let's start this morning with repentance. Let's just acknowledge what we tend to do and how quickly we tend to, to, to do it. Let's stop being a part of the problem. Number two, let's change the pattern. You are the men and women of God. We are the people of God. We are of Christ. As I see it, we have an option. To turn every complaint into a prayer would be a powerful transition of life. It would be a powerful force that changes you from the inside out. The Bible says you cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve both of these agendas at the same time. James 3. But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come both blessings and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be this way. Can somebody say amen? It shouldn't be. Not from us. And so my challenge to you is to stop wasting your breath, which is the title of the message this morning. Does complaining actually help? Why waste your breath? Why waste other people's time? Why lead other people down that path? It's time to be salt and light people. We are salt people. We are light people in this world. Psalm 118 my dad's favorite verse, the verse that makes me think of him all the time. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us complain, murmur, bash, gripe. There's another word that I won't use, but you know it. <laughs> you know it. It's from living with Ryan, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Let's not defile the day. By the way, which is the day that the Lord has made? Yeah, every day. <laughs> every day. Everyone say every day. The, every day is a gift from God for us. And I would like to say, let's not defile the day the Lord has made with complaint and criticism and judgment. Let's not operate in the flesh and let's not tempt others to do the same. Let's breathe some life into this world. Let's breathe something that's fresh and new, something that's different and wonderful. Let's do something useful. Let's not waste our breath. But let's let our breath breathe the life of God, the word of God, the truth of God, the encouragement of God. Folks, I just want to invite you, light a candle. Light a candle, my brothers and sisters. Light a candle in this world. Stop cursing the darkness. It's a waste of time. Let's bow and pray. Father, I want to I start by repenting for myself. <laughs> Just, Lord, start with me, please. You know how I am. You know how I can be. Lord, you know all of us. There are some people here who kind of have a general awareness of what this word means, but, but I think most of us have a very deep understanding about what this word is. And Lord, I think you're really trying to change us from the inside out so that you can pour out your spirit. You're preparing the vessel of our soul so that we can walk into the fullness of what you have for us. Lord, this morning as we repent, we ask you to cleanse us and forgive us, which we know you do by the blood of Jesus. And now, Lord, we pray that from our lips, the world will begin to hear a different story and hear a different tone and that there'll be light and hope in it. Sow and scatter us into our world this week, where in this week and in the days to come, we turn our every instinct of complaint into a word of prayer to you. We ask that you would help us do this in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. and everyone at home said, Amen. didn't hear you at home? Okay, I'm <laughs> just kidding. All right. Well, it's wonderful to have you back and wonderful to see you all. And if you have been waiting to have a chance to be prayed for, we welcome you to wait in your seat where you are. We'll come and find you. We'll meet you. If there's nobody at the front or there is space, uh, 
go ahead and make your way up to the front and we'll certainly come and find you. Uh, remember that the options for giving are available out in the hub and do that. And we welcome you to remember now. We still need to register. We still need to count for a little while longer. Everybody, we're almost at the end. We've almost made it. And pretty soon the mass and the restrictions are going to come off. But let's not grow weary at the last day. Let's just, just keep it up, okay? So I'm going to dismiss you now. Um, it actually occurs to me that I forgot to do something. So I'm going to undismiss you and make you stay. And I just, want to, I just want to pray. There are people who tune in, and I don't want to forget this. Just because I know so many of the faces, I don't want to forget that people are tuning in and, and joining us. And so perhaps you're a person that, who's listening or watching. Maybe you're here this morning, and you've never given your heart to Jesus. This transformation happens from the inside out, but it comes with surrendering our old self to him and asking him to forgive us. And then he puts his spirit in us, which allows us to be different than we used to be. It makes us a new creation, the Bible says. And so if there's somebody watching and you've never made that commitment, but you want to do it now, I want to just share a prayer with you. And you make this prayer your own, and then you get in touch with us and let us know the decision you've made. We want to walk with you as you learn how to not to do all the things you used to do, like we're all learning how to not do the things we used to do. By the grace of God. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, just pray this prayer. And maybe you folks in the sanctuary would help me with this. Just pray out loud. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the grace of God. We thank you for the cross of Jesus where my sin was paid for. Today I confess that I have lived independently, that I've ignored you, God, my creator. But today I return. I come home. I ask you to forgive my sin to cleanse me from all unrighteousness, and to make me a new person from the inside out. Make me the person you designed me to be, God. I receive the life of Jesus, eternal life, now. And thank you for this great gift. Now give me the strength and the grace to learn what it means to walk with God. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you prayed that prayer, you get in touch with us. We want to walk with you. All right. All you captive audiences now, you can get out on it here. <laughs> All right, God bless you as you go. Great to see you. See you next Sunday.